Hi, good morning and welcome to this um, webinar, which is um, strictly speaking for technologies for academics. Now, unfortunately at ZP, we don't um, hang around very much, so I'm going to sort of jump straight into it because I do appreciate that there's quite a few people, um, let's say, in the room and there'll be more people um, joining very shortly. Um, I'm making the assumption that you, you can um, hear me OK, so um, I'll go forward, let's say, very quickly. Um, so today we're talking about um, technologies really for academia, and I am specifically talking about um, creating um, an impact. Now, that what does that term really mean? Well, it really means that if we're going to do stuff in the lab, then we really want to kind of get it out into the lab and you know into into other people's hands. Otherwise, you know we haven't really unlocked the true value, let's say, of the um, of the um, technology. So let me um, play that point today. There's a couple of things I'm going to talk about. One of them is going to be about um, point of care type um, technologies using things like screen printed electrodes. So I have a point of care technology um, in front of me and um, it's called the Sense It All. And I will be, um, let's say, um, zooming in on this in a little bit and sort of giving you a little bit of a sort of demonstration on this technology. Um, and also to talking about actually the merger between technologies like this and what we actually do in the laboratory. So suddenly the world of potential stats looking like potential stats and products looking like products, um, that has really kind of gone away. And this is actually both a potential stat and a product, but I will talk about that um, very shortly. I'm also gonna talk about um, wearables and microneedles um, fairly quickly. So what I mean by that is, um, if I just kind of go to um, here, I do have a um, a smartwatch. This is probably one of the most um, uh, technologically advanced uh, smartwatches in the world. This has got uh, micro needles on the back of it. Um, people do reach out to us about micro needle technology quite a bit. Um, but this watch, I mean, it looks quite um, let's say standard in some ways, but actually, it's it's had at least twenty million euros invested in it. So these kind of smartwatches for micro needles. Uh, are by fight by um, no way um, super trivial. With that said, so I will talk about um, wearable OEMs as well. Just about to, um, but I will start off with actually wearables and then move on to um, in vitro diagnostics and point of need um, testing. Just FYI, if you're kind of doing an academic research, I always suggest actually that, you know, even if you want to develop technologies for diabetics, start off with point of need testing and advance your research into wearables because it's actually much easier to do point of need testing than it is necessarily to do um, wearables. That said, this is a bit of a, I just sort of jumped into something very quickly um, and I'm just gonna um, slightly turn off a couple of things here because what I have here is I have a whole series of QR codes um, and what I want to express with these QR codes um, is actually the hardware that I have in um, front of me, um, the Sensei All platform. So I'll just, um, when I say when I say the Sensei All platform, um, this technology here, which is in Bluetooth uh, connection with my um, app, I am actually able then through these QR codes to go from sort of specific testing, things like um, pH, um, nitrate, glucose, um, potassium under here, and also do standard lab tests like amperometry and open circuit potential. So I'll just grab my, um, I'm just gonna grab my phone for a second. Um, I know it's not gonna be super clear, but I will do a, a proper demonstration later on. But if I want to run amperometry on the hardware, I'm just gonna um, very quickly um, scan the QR code on my screen. And um, in fact, I would did open circuit potential next to it. And now I've done, um, now I've done amperometry. So I'm able to go, I'm able to change what this app on my phone does going from chili, ginger, pH, glucose, potassium, amperometry, open circuit potential, for example, just by using QR codes. And then what that means then is, if, so I'll do open circuit potential now. What that means then is this device, though ZP uses it as a product and ZP uses it with clients, is a very unusual device actually, because at the moment you can kind of see this kind of um, got blue LEDs here. It has a very nice way of being able to put um, screen printed electrodes or sensors into it. it has a very nice way of um, dismantling if somebody uh, for some reason gets it kind of dirty we can just take it apart and um, clip it all back together again 
So it has much more of a product um, user experience um, sensation about it, but actually it's also a lab um, potential stat. So I'll dig into that um, slightly more um, as we go forward, but I just wanted to put that, that will be demoed um, later on. So I came slightly off script, but um, contents today, we will talk about micro needles. Um, we will talk about screen printed electrodes. I will talk about that. I think the true, the key performance indicator of a screen printed electrode is not um, peak to peak separation. You know, people are very keen when they're doing voltammetry that the peak to peak separation is 59 millivolts and that the um, the signal for the analyte is proportional or the current is proportional to the square root of the scan rate. These are interesting and yes, we can achieve them, but actually I think reproducibility of those screen printed electrodes is essentially the most key um, parameter that is kind of overlooked. Um, I want to talk about electrode customization. I say here pros and cons. Um, I think the problem with customization that when people ask for it, you know, I want to make a, a you know a custom screen printed electrode and I want, um, you know, I, I want a very distinct pattern on that screen printed electrode. The problem with that is then it kind of leads to, um, it actually leads to poor quality. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about price quality and manufacturing volume as well. Um, so I am talking about technologies that I think will help people make an impact. We'll basically get technology out of the lab. Um, and so unfortunately, out of the lab does mean actually into commercialization. Um, so, and I'll also talk about some of the pitfalls where people actually try to do too much customization too early. Um, and they basically keep themselves in what I call technology readiness level number three, when actually we want the technology readiness level number nine. But I will um, cover that. Um, I'll talk about electronics. I think we live in a very interesting moment, actually, when um, it's good to do electronics and it's good to build instruments. But you must understand, I think these days, actually, that the instruments that are now available are so powerful. There are places where you can spend your time. And I think that the most valuable place you can spend your time is actually doing the assay itself. So, you know, what I mean by that? So I'll, I'll talk about it today. But when you're working on functionalizing electrodes to make them specific to an analyte, and then you're testing with real samples and you're developing the method files and the calibration routine, that's where you add the value. Um, something I learned in Silicon Valley, you know, a good 15 years ago, somebody said to me, well, the electronics are not so interesting to me because I always know I can do the electronics. It's the assay that's actually really interesting to me. And I've always held that with me that um, we will talk about electronics today. And I also say that electronics now that are available to the R&D market are essentially so good that actually the only reason that we would do things like open source potential stats is to train and to teach, but not necessarily doesn't necessarily move this the science um, necessarily um, forward. Um, I will talk about commercialization strategies or impact strategies, how to get from TRL3 to TRL9. I'm sure so many of you are, already, are, are fully aware of what technology readiness level means, but technology readiness level, if you're not sure, was a thing um, principle uh, invented by NASA so that they could have a conversation. They could say, well, you know, this is the beginning of the journey for us. This is technology readiness level one. And at the very end of the journey, when it was very robust, they would say that's technology readiness level level number nine. And it basically costs more and more. The more robust and the higher you come up in technology readiness levels, the harder it is to do and the more expensive it actually is. But I think we do have a strategy at ZP to actually really accelerate uh, from TRL nine, let's say, to T, sorry, TRL three to TRL um, nine. I'm only going to do one slide on ZP. So we were launched in 2014. So hooray, it's our 10 year birthday this year. Um, we are ISO 13485, which means that um, we can work on technologies um, such as, um, uh, you know, we can work on this kind of technology. This is not my technology, this is Abbott, but this is a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor. But we do work on products of this kind of standard and this kind of complexity. Um, we are contract developers, contract manufacturers, and we do make our own standard products as well. But I only wanted to do one slide on ZP because I want to be respectful of people's time. Um, I'm going to sort of slightly go to the first thing that I said that we would talk about today, which is uh, micro needles and wearable biosensors. So at ZP, we do work on a lot of configurations. I mean, I'm sure many of you who work in wearables these days will understand, you know, that there are the skin has more than this many layers. But, you know, we have the epidermis, which is that you know, the top layer of the skin, then the dermis and then the subcutaneous layer. 
people are very interested actually in um, measuring things on the skin. I think the CGM market, the continuous glucose monitoring market, which is, I think, dominated be honest with you, by Abbott and Dexcom these days with a, a more minor part played by Medtronic. That market's probably worth about 10 billion um, and is growing. Um, at ZP, we do work on what we call transdermal sensors. These are sensors that stick into the ground, uh, stick into the ground, <laughs> stick into the skin. Um, we work on micro needles. I know that's what many of you may be interested in. Um, I think micro needles is, are a good technology. They're both, um, um, let's say, give um, less pain. Um, and also they do away with this problem. So I just want to kind of highlight this for anyone that this is the applicator for many of these CGM technologies that um, may be on the market. Um, the applicator is a huge piece of, that's a relatively large piece of plastic. And I just had an email last night, actually, it's from somebody who said, we've got to do away with this because it's grams and grams of plastic. So there are interesting problems to be solved by academics. Um, and one of them could actually just be the application of um, biosensors. I think microneedles actually don't require these kind of applicators. But um, um, at ZP, we do work on non-invasive. When I say non-invasive, we're generally working in the sweat um, and there are companies out there today that are working on kind of hydration and um, they've, they've kind of gone to market, or at least they're pilot studying and doing pilot studies with people. And then also um, something we do a lot of at ZP is implanted sensors as well. It's fully implanted. Um, and there is a company on the market doing it, a fully implanted um, of course, um, making sure I get it the right way around, Sensionics that um, does a fully implanted sensor for diabetics that sits um, in the skin. Um, this is some of the technology that we have. I'll go a little bit quicker because I, I always say I want to be respectful of people's time. So um, um, we do have these um, sensor packages, which we do in glucose and cortisol. And these actually have to be really robust because this fish is not dead. This fish is anesthetized and the sensor package is actually put inside the fish. And these fish, um, they look, you know, they are perfectly healthy, but they've actually got the sensor package residing within them whilst they're swimming in this tank, you know, they're free to move around, they're not tethered in any way, but actually we do have a package in there continually monitoring um, glucose. And um, this is the data that's actually coming off those fish. So when they get a glucose um, spike, the um, signal changes or, uh, or they're fed rather, the glucose um, changes accordingly. Now, um, I did say that we would talk about uh, microneedles this morning. So this is, um, one of the technologies um, that ZP has been kind of heavily um, working on for the last, um, at least um, pre-COVID, we, we started on this kind of work. What I have here is a watch. Um, on the watch is actually a kind of a carrier, and on the carrier is actually these microneedles. This kind of technology, um, it's actually, I mean, it's it's really expensive to kind of get into this game. I'm sure many of you are aware, but there's a company in San Diego um, called Biolink. Um, Biolink have just raised over 50 million US dollars and they're working on a micro needle patch. So it's kind of like the Abbott um, Freestyle Libre 2 and the Abbott Freestyle Libre 2 goes here. But Abbott actually use a um, they use what's called a sort of filament. Um, um, it's very hard to see, in fact, and I'm just trying to think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very hard to see, but the Abbott has a has a has a filament that sticks out of this um, patch. Now, what Dexcom, not Dexcom, sorry, what Biolink are doing, they're actually replacing, um, they're replacing the filament with an array of micro needles, and they've just raised fifty million or over fifty million US dollars to actually do that. Um, with that said, they previously raised a hundred million US dollars. So you understand at this point. In order to do a micro needle smart, they weren't doing a smart watch, they're doing a smart patch. Um, they've raised 150 million US dollars. And it's it's got to be raised because I think people kind of come and say, oh, well, I want to make a micro needle, you know, and it's like, do you know how hard and expensive this really is to do? But it, to be honest, your academia is one of the best places that this work should be done because actually it will take, you know, several years to, to make all this kind of technology um, fairly good. Um, so at ZP, um, we, 
I do like this kind of microneedle technology and these transdermal sensors because it's really just a repositioning of science that we've always had. The one thing I like about electrochemistry, I think this um, this video kind of shows it, is you know that you can detect uh, molecules in samples, you know, which are probably fairly ill prepared, not ill prepared, but under prepared. You know, here we're just using whole blood, and you get a result um, fairly quickly, and that's one of the kind of key aspects of um, electrochemistry and that that science is translated really well um, over then to CGM which I think one of the best technologies for doing um, wearable biosensors is, is electrochemistry I know I'm super biased on that so you know I have to kind of put a disclaimer that you know having a PhD in electrochemistry of course I would be biased but I have looked at other technologies and also when you look at the market itself um, I w I'm not going to cover this today, but there are plenty of people who are trying to do non-invasive glucose monitoring. And I don't even think it's one of my slides. because I took them out. But Apple have been trying to do non-invasive glucose monitoring with their um, watch. I would suggest that they've probably been spending something like 100 million on it for about 15 years. Um, they're not there yet. Now, at ZP, we do have um, when I talk about um, this watch, I'll just go to this screen here. So when I. When I talk about this um, watch, and um, this is something that we use with um, some of our large clients, um, you know, as I say, on the on what we have is a um, is the watch itself, which contains the electronics, both in a kind of sort of a very kind of um, prototype version, but then also in a more sportswear version, and then the needles themselves or the micro needle patch is here, and it kind of clips on, and that makes electrical connection for us. And then when I put the watch onto my um, wrist, this is what I like about micro needles that the the um, the watch strap is essentially you know pulling the micro needles into my arm. So that's kind of quite um, a useful let's say phenomena. And no disrespect to um, companies that otherwise make these um, make these kind of wire transdermal sensors. But they do have this sort of large applicator and this and I've also got a Dexcom in, in this office as well. And they have a similar thing, a large applicator. So I, I do like that aspect of the um, of the micro needles as the ease of which we can actually put these micro needles. And they're they're really not painful either um, into the. And by the way, I don't I don't find these particularly painful either, but that's a personal thing. I think some people do. Um, the applicator has a large spring in it. So when this thing applies it's a massive spring or well, as massive as it is a relative term but it's a big spring that sort of forces that into your arm um so if some people find that uncomfortable i'm personally okay with it at zp we do have some of these we do have a version of the micro needle technology available on the website and we also do have um electronics to drive it as well the reason i bring this up is i i think it's worth saying that at zp we do have tier one and tier two technology tier one is stuff that you know, some of our clients, are, as you could appreciate when I say you could appreciate, actually, I'll just go to this. Um, so I am just saying we we do have this kind of technology um, available, the, at least the micro needles on the web store. And we also have electronics to drive these kind of micro needle technologies. Um, what we do on the web store is something that we just do for the R&D community. But we do have then the sort of this kind of technology, which is the watch technology. But the watch technology, as I say, has had at least 20 million euros invested in it. It's had 50 patents put around it. And we do use that kind of technology then with um, much larger clients because the cost of when just out of interest, patent maintenance, when you've got something like 50 patents is hundreds of thousands of dollars or euros per year. It's really expensive. So we do reserve the watch technology for the larger clients, but we do micro needle technology and and electronics um, onto the website as well. We are having a new wearable, I would call it almost wearable potential stack coming very soon as well. So if you follow ZP on the YouTube or LinkedIn or um, just keep re returning to the website because we are going to release a new um, essentially wearable potential stack that's both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi enabled. And so you will be able to write commands to it through the Bluetooth and you will be able to get data off it via the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And I think this is really going to help accelerate, um, let's say, the academic development. Because I know I said it at the beginning, see, but um, electronics, there's so many um, 
semiconductor companies now that are actually getting into electrochemical sensing technology that the need to develop electronics is dr has dramatically decreased. Uh, there's all, already analog devices that are in this market, but there's so many more that are actually coming in. And I think what's nice is the electronics industry has realized that the best technology between electronics and the world of chemistry and biology is actually electrochemistry. And I think the, the, the clue is actually in the name, you know, electrochemistry, electronics industry, appreciate that it's actually the purest sort of science between what they do, they like to design analog front ends and what people are actually interested in measuring, which is biology and chemistry. And electrochemistry is that perfect sort of uh, bridge between electronics and the real world in which we live. I'm slightly going to change um, slight gear for a second and talk about point of care IVD. Now, when I talk about point of care and IVD, I want to talk about two things. Um, I know I've got the hardware in front of me, um, but I want to talk about um, electronics and I want to talk about um, screen printed electrodes. Um, I will spend quite a lot of time talking about screen printed electrodes because I do want to sort of, I want to give a perspective on what I think is sort of slightly wrong with let's say screen print electro especially in the sort of research community um so i will give a um as i say i'm going to focus in on the um, screen print electrodes and i will focus on the electronics i didn't say it but i'm also going to do a demonstration at the end of all of this where actually i do make some measurements um in the office um and i'm also going to send the data to the cloud as well so i think the gap between now between doing something in the lab and doing something on a essentially on a machine that looks like a product, that gap has been certainly closed. That's why I think we can go from TRL3 to TRL9 much faster than historically um, one would have otherwise thought. Just out of interest, you know, so I'm a big proponent of screen printed electrodes. Why do I do this? Well, because screen printed electrodes have proven themselves to be a robust and manufacturable technology for doing um, point of care uh, testing. You know, so this is the, um, this is a product by Johnson & Johnson um, for measuring blood glucose. And this is a company called Radiometer, who are part of the Danaher group these days. Danaher is a sort of multi-billion dollar company that has a lot of um, companies underneath it, but they bought Radiometer. And when you look at both OneTouch and Radiometer, um, you'll find out that Radiometer are using um, thick film printing and they are doing blood gas analysis. So blood gas analysis would include, you know, glucose, lactate, oxygen, pH, maybe hematocrit, um, probably CO2, um, all these things, they they will measure them using um, thick film printing or screen printing. And then one touch is a kind of um, classic screen printed, very simple design, just using carbon electrodes. Um, and it just demonstrates that actually you, the one thing about screen print electrodes is they have been demonstrated to be manufacturable at volume. The one thing about screen print electrodes as well is that people say, oh, therefore, um, they must be low cost, but I want to talk about cost versus quality um, in a in a slight while as well. Um, I do ask this question quite a bit, but this is actually the best selling glucose strip technology in the market um, in its heyday. And I always think this is kind of interesting because it's something I will touch upon in a minute as well, actually, is why was this the best selling glucose technology in the market? You know, was it because it was most accurate, most precise, lowest cost? And it was actually because it was available in um, more than one color people could just click this um, click the cover off put their own color on there and sort of essentially customize it, it so it's just something that we slightly overlook sometimes when we've got our kind of scientific and engineering hats on that actually impact can actually come from that user experience and i think that's somewhat um, overlooked that and that's probably what happens you know that we get to technology readiness level three which is a scientific paper but then you know the whole how is somebody really going to use this is not dealt with because it feels like it's so far off. But as I hope today, actually, it's able to demonstrate to you, it's definitely not so far off. So the main problem that I think with screen print electrodes at the moment, and I might just turn off a few cameras for a second, um, is, you know, there's an expectation on price and that expectation on price um, actually is impacting on quality. And I think actually one of the big problems, I would say, with um, screen printed electrodes is actually that there's more choice than there is actually demand. I'll give you some quick maths on this in a minute. But what I mean is there's so much choice out there on screen printed electrodes that it's actually meaning that there's a finite demand on the market, but so much choice that actually 
nobody's really manufacturing screen printed electrodes for the R&D community, a particularly high volume, which is affecting both the price, but actually the quality as well. And I will talk about that um, as well. And I think there's an oversupply or an over eagerness in customization that it's too easy for people to say, oh, I need a custom electrode. And um, and then people say, oh, yeah, I'll do it for you. But it does in the end. And I've got a case study on that where actually it does lead to um, business failure to go um, too, too quickly into customization. So I think we got this slight problem going on um, in the in in the sort of screen printed electrode world that we've got. You know, everyone wants um, quality and price. This is not this is not limited to screen printed electrodes. This is just, you know, in general, people they want high quality and they'd like it at a low price. But quality, you know, if we were talking about an example in, in the defense industry, in the defense industry, people definitely want things to work. So they want a high quality and they're willing to pay the price. Now, there's a different subset of people, which is actually um, academics, students, um, PhDs, postdocs, who also need quality. So when we talk about screen printed electrodes, they need quality in the screen printed electro because they need to do science upon that. The science is a, is a sort of... Um, you get essentially numbers out of it. Those numbers give you a certain accuracy and precision. There's a so people need um, quality, but the budgets in academia are not the same as the military. So people need quality, um, but they want it at a lower price. And so there's this kind of dichotomy here. I think this is solvable, by the way. But I also think there's a bit of a problem going on here. This we want quality, but we can't necessarily. We're not the same as the defense industry. We need it at a different price. There's one way to have quality and price, and the one way to have quality and price is actually to have large volume. But I did say earlier on, and actually I think there's a bit of a supply or over um, too much choice in the market. And then all that choice means that there's no real high volume manufacturing going on. So, you know, for example, it's, it's, what I would illustrate it by saying this, you know, that if I look at my phone, this phone is running an app, by the way, that's in Bluetooth connection with that meter. This phone is actually not that expensive. It's got a lot of capability. It's got all these cameras. It's got all this, you know, memory on board. It's got all this connectivity and it's not that expensive. But the reason it's not that expensive is because actually they've they've got to high volume. But I'm saying that there's a problem in screen printed electrodes actually that because everyone is very um, doing customization, different vendors, um, different designs from different vendors, it leads to very low volume. A very low volume means that and means actually you request a low price, but because it's low volume, you also get a low quality as well. But and that's a problem that we've been trying to fix at ZP for quite some time. So if I imagine the market, I can think of most of you can think of at least three or four people selling screen printed electrodes. There's probably a lot more than that. In in reality, ZP is just one of many. So, you know, we can't deny, you know, there's nothing special about us. We're just one of many. Um, and sometimes people drop out the market and sometimes um, people come into the market to replace it. So there's a little bit of a churn, but there is plenty of choice of where you get your screen printed electrodes from. And this is only from ZP's website. When we first started ZP, and as I say, we're coming, in, coming into our 10th year now, um, we actually offered a lot of choice. Um, and this is when this kind of thinking actually came along. So I realized we were actually offering a lot of choice. And then you also have another sort of um, um, variable in the market that you know people are actually making their own um, screen printed electrodes as well so it's a lots of vendors lots of choice and there are other people you know doing um, homemade um, screen printed electrodes as well so if you think if you imagine that there were 10 vendors in the world and those 10 vendors were all producing let's say 50 different types of screen printed electrodes and I did a quick count on one of the um, vendor elect vendor sites yesterday and they did have about 50 electrodes that means that there's at least, so let's say today you've made a decision, you said, oh, I want to make, I want to do some development work on a screen printed electrode. That means that there's at least 500 screen printed electrodes out there in the market. Now, what that means is, if you could just imagine for a second, how many, how many, um, um, how many um, screen printed electrodes are sold in the R&D market per annum? You know, let me, you know, when, when I say, you know, to the R&D market, let's say just true purely to academic institutes, universities, colleges, research institutes. But, you know, it's possibly a million screen printed electrodes are sold per annum, which sounds like a high volume. But take that one million um, electrodes and actually realize that that one million, there's probably over 500 actual products on the market. So if I was to 
just evenly distribute those 1 million sales of screen printed electrodes. That's in volume. So, you know, there's 1 million screen printed electrodes probably made and sold to the academic community per year. That means that any one of those products is only selling 2,000 at most screen printed electrodes per year. And that leads to a really weird market dynamic because to produce 2,000 screen printed electrodes, ZP, ZP could produce that in a couple of minutes. You know, so if I produce that, it, it would just be what we call seven sheets. So I have about 300 electrodes on a sheet. I produce seven sheets, that's 2,100. So just understand that the there's not that many people, um, well, sorry, there's not that many um, R&D screen printed electrodes being purchased per year. I think 1 million is quite high number. And that's distributed over a vast range of screen printed electrodes. And to produce let's say 2000, which might be the annual sales for a screen printed electrode, it only takes a few minutes or a few, you know, in some cases, only a few seconds to produce those. So what does that lead to? This is not high volume. It's not even low volume. This is almost zero volume, in fact, when it comes to um, screen printing. So SPE, screen printed electrodes, are being manufactured and essentially left on the shelf to age. And this is what's going on. Um, and only so for me, only high volume can um, drive low prices and high quality. So if we can get high volume, we get low prices and we can get um, high quality. And this is what this is what we've been trying to work on at ZP. And I think we're doing quite a good job on it. So this is the kind of model today when actually um, the quality is fairly low um, and the price, you know, the price is fairly low and the quality is also fairly low. So at ZP, we're trying to actually move this um, curve. So the price stays where it is. And in fact, I think we've got one of the lowest prices, but we've actually done the quality. Now, how have we actually done this? So, you know, here we are 10 years in um, at ZP making, you know, screen printed electrodes. Just FYI, I started my career making um, biosensors in about 2000. So when I say ZP is 10 years in, I might be 24 years in on this. Um, but we realized, you know, we actually made a large range of electrodes and it led to a case where actually none of it was actually selling in high volume. Total volume was fine, but none of it was selling in high volume. So what do we now do? It's slightly unusual. Is actually say to when people contact us, it's actually say, you know, actually not limiting the choice because all these electrodes are still available, but actually guiding people and saying, look, if you come on to this electrode, we produce this in high volume, and I'll show you the quality data in a minute, but we produce it in high volume and we can offer it at low cost. So what is wrong with screen printed electrodes? I hear so many people say, oh, it's reproducibility. You know, it's the quality that's the problem. Why is it like this? Well, it's like this because lots of vendors producing lots of choice, feeding a finite market. When in fact, we don't really need, unfortunately, in my opinion, that is, we don't need all this choice. And I'll try and build that argument up a little bit more um, as we go along. But at ZP, we kind of say, OK, we do have all this choice. But when people contact me and say, I want to have carbon electrode, I honestly say, take the 501 or take the hypervalued carbon electrode, reproduce it in high volume, it's low cost, and it's got high quality. But I have to prove those points to you now. So the direction that we're taking on price, for example, is we've got these 501 um, carbon electrodes, and today we can produce them at like one euro 76 each, which some of you say oh, that's hor horrific. Um, but actually we then, we do have another electrode that we do do it in lower, sorry, at higher volumes. So we've got higher volume on this, still the same quality and it's at um, 90 cents or 0 0.9 euros each and I was talking to some people that there was a conference in Spain last week and I was telling them about this and they were like oh that is cheaper than we're actually getting our electrodes today and our electrodes today are actually not that good you know so um, now how are we doing this is because actually rather than saying to everyone oh yeah yeah we've got these electrodes these electrodes and these electrodes which is basically um, meaning that none of those electrodes are made at high volume. We're guiding people and saying, look, these are the electrodes that we believe in, because actually, in fact, I have a um, I have a demo in front of me here, and you can see that you know we're using those electrodes um, in our own, let's say, um, products. Um, so if we can drive, or not drive, yeah, if we can basically standardize on electrodes, the volume goes up, the quality goes up, and the price comes down. But when there's so many vendors with so much choice, ends up diluting the finite demand and actually it leads to the price people won't pay a high price but the quality is actually what's um suffering a little bit on this so i will talk about quality 
I want to talk about quality metrics. I will go a little bit, um, let's say, faster. I think we're looking at the wrong metrics when it comes to screen printed electrodes. So what do I mean by this? This is some data off um, one of our hypervalued carbon electrodes. And here we're sort of showing peak current versus the square root of scan rate. And I understand that, you know, people like this kind of data. Oh, I like to see my current versus the square root of scan rate. You know, what does it really tell you? It just tells you that your process is under diffusion control. Um, and you can get a nice straight line and you know you can publish a paper. But that when we're talking about screen printed electrodes, we're actually talking about making a low cost platform that we one day want into a product. So as interesting as this metric is, and ZP can you know essentially meet this metric, it's not the most important metric. Reproducibility of the screen printed electrode is the most important metric. The other metric that people are very interested in is um, what's the peak to peak separation so, for example, you know, with a molecule like um, ferry ferrocyanides, um, what's your peak to peak separation? And, you know, we all know um, that, you know, 59 millivolts divided by the number of electrons is a kind of, you know, shows that it is um, thermodynamically reversible. That's all very interesting. But actually, peak to peak separation doesn't um, it doesn't help you in the translation of science into real products. If you want perfect, let's say, CVs, then you know, use a glassy carbon electrode, for example, but a glassy carbon electrode will never translate into a low cost product. So we have these metrics of, oh, well, is my signal or my current proportional square root of scan rate? Is my peak to peak separation 59 millivolts? Here we've got at the lower scan rates, you've got like 67 and a half, which is um, eight and a half millivolts of theoretical. So yeah, sure, we can we can achieve it, but it's the wrong metric as far as I'm concerned. And then is what's your, um, what's your analogic peak current ratio to your um, cathodic peak current and it should be you know one to one let's say if it was a reversible um, system and again we can meet it but meeting that shouldn't be our um, our focus our focus should actually be a different type of metric so when you when you watch zp do any of our demonstrations you will see something that we try to do which is there's no calibration right now that's important to you that that the fact that we do no calibration comes from the fact that um, I have to sort of comes from the fact that we um, we have a reproducible underlying screen print electrode. When you require calibration or normalization of your data, it's because the screen print electrode is fundamentally irreproducible and you're compensating for it. The problem with having calibration in a assay is that it's um, it leads to um, complex assays. So the fact that we have good underlying screen print electrodes leads to um, simpler assays. Simpler assays lead to, unfortunately, the, that bad word of commercialization that we can actually commercialize on top of these. And that means impact. So for me, I think that screen printed electrodes are a good technology. In fact, I've got some glucose strips here. You know, they have proven to be a really scalable technology for making low cost sensors that can impact people's lives. But in the R&D market, where all of this kind of technology now starts, there's so, you know, lots of vendors, vendors is good. Every vendor is offering about 50 electrodes. 50 electrodes means that there's, you know, at least 500 choices out there. And there's probably less than 1 million actually being sold per annum, which means that less than 2,000 screen print electrodes per, let's say, um, per screen print electrode are actually being sold. And um, at ZP, we've really shifted this and say, look, we do have choice, but actually, Choices, choices. What's kind of essentially killing the quality, and that problem with quality then impacts actually into the research, and people are coming up with normalization of signals and calibration routines, and that's once you start doing that, it's then you're moving yourself further and further away from TRL nine. Um, so it all starts almost on almost on the fundamentals, let's say. Um, now, I do want to talk about um, reproducibility. So at ZP, we do do a lot of um, electrochemistry. And what we're doing is we're checking, we're making these sheets of electrodes, and we are checking that our um, electrochemical signals are reproducible. So this is sheet two. Um, there's possibly about, I'm going to just quickly estimate, it's about 10 tests here, and you can't see the difference between the 10 tests. So I'm not so interested, actually, in peak-to-peak -peak separation. I'm generally interested in reproducibility because I know reproducibility is um, will get me from TRL three to TRL nine much quicker. Um, this is sheet six. This is sheet eighteen. So you can see we produce a number of sheets, and all of the sheets are actually tested 
essentially by electrochemical methods to make sure that um, they are reproducible. So I said that I think the KPI is wrong. It's not about um, peak current versus square root of scan rate. It's not about peak to peak separation being 59 millivolts over N. It's not about peak to peak, um, anodic peak versus cathodic peak having a ratio of one. These are interesting and they're good and we, we can meet them. But I actually want the focus to be on reproducibility. And so at ZP, when we produce a bunch of electrodes or a batch of electrodes, um, we and we're getting high volume and high quality because we're actually definitely saying, you know, we're trying to advise people and say, you know, adopt these particular electrodes rather than all the other ones we have in the catalogue, because then we're actually making these week in or day in, day out. And that's how you get quality when you're actually producing lots and lots of these electrodes. So when we look at these sheets, we look at the mean, we look at the standard deviation, we look at the relative standard deviation, and we, and we you know, we do that throughout um, throughout the um, batch um, as well. And then we have found we, here we have a, like a mean of five, about 5.86. But when you look at the means of everything, everything's very, uh, very tight. And I think when people see this, we've had batches of screen printed electrodes where the relative standard deviation is like 3%. So we generally definitely want it in the single digits, but I think we're one of the few companies that actually does this amount of testing. And I know some of you will have heard me say this before, but the reason that ZP does this is the biggest user of ZP screen printed electrodes is Zimmer and Peacock. And then we put them on the R&D web store, but we're actually the biggest users of these. And that's a very different business model, whereas otherwise screen printed electrodes are produced for you with the person producing them doesn't have the quality of them doesn't have a direct impact upon them, whereas the quality of these screen electrodes has a direct impact on ZP. Um, so this means that when we test at different concentrations, actually each color here represents a different concentration. You can see that we actually end up with um, very good reproducibility and we don't need to reject outliers, which I'm sure is happening a lot because of the reproducibility um, issue. And then if we put an error bar on this, it, mean, it means it's useful because uh, I'll just turn some um, cameras off so you can see. So if we put some error bars in here, then our error bars are actually quite um, small and we do have a useful um, assay, good linearity, good repeatability. And that's something then that's much easier to go from TRL3 in the lab to TRL9, which we do want um, for um, actual testing. Just a kind of um, something that we have run into a few times as well is that people get the screen print electrodes and they have, you know, an expected result and the actual result is not what they're expecting and that's when we have to actually figure out the connectors as well so I think one of the biggest problems that happens in screen printed electrodes sometimes is people say oh it's not working right it's actually just a connector um, so at ZP we have most of you will be using a potential stat that has banana plugs of either two millimeter or four millimeter diameters and at ZP we have created connectors for the four millimeter and for the two millimeter um, banana plugs on those um, potential stats. Electro customization. So a lot of people will come to say, I need a custom screen printed electrode. It's a very dangerous path to go through. I mean, dangerous, I'm using some hyperbole language here. It is, a, it is a problem. The most common requests we get are people want two um, electrodes. Because basically what they want to do is they want to do what we call a null electrode and a working electrode, and they're going to subtract the signal. So one electrode has enzyme on it, the other electrode doesn't have enzyme on it has just protein and they're going to do a subtraction of signal. Um, now at ZP we're very interesting, well I think we've, we're fairly knowledgeable because actually that, ta ta that strategy seems so elegant but it very rarely works and in fact if you look at Dexcom, who was a company I mentioned earlier on, they had a generation 3 CGM, quick reminder, continuous glucose monitor, this is a CGM, this is Abbott's not Dexcom, but Dexcom did actually try this strategy of having two electrodes, one with enzyme, one without enzyme, and they do a subtraction. And they don't do it anymore. They're on about generation seven these days. They don't do it because it very rarely works. In fact, I think it's practically never works because you end up creating yourself two problems. You end up making a problem with an enzyme that's functionalized for the analyte and an enzyme that's not functionalized for the analyte. So in fact, you now have two manufacturing processes that you have to get right, and they have to both work on the same screen printed electrode. So even though the idea of having two working electrodes seems so elegant, it doesn't translate well into actually manufactured products. And if you want to take a lesson from history, have a look at the Dexcom Generation 3 sensor. The other request, and this is a ZP product, is that we do multiple analytes. Um, and this is another example of multiple analytes. I just want to do a, a quick mental thought for you. I understand you know, the desire for multiple analytes, and ZP does have technologies for doing multiple analytes. 
But when you try to do multiple analytes on one um, substrate, if you can just think about yields, think about, you know, every time you do a deposition, if your probability of success is 90 percent, if you do nine depositions, then your probability of success is 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9. So it's basically 0.9 to the power of nine. That takes you well below a, a yield of 50 percent. So there are many available screen print electrodes out there where multiple um where it's possible to do multiple analytes and this is a zp product especially the one in brown with a big zp on it but actually it transmutes really badly when it actually comes to manufacturing and so when you want to go from trl3 to trl9 it's a real problem these having these all these sensors fabricated on one substrate zp does have strategies around this but just be very careful because these electrodes are available hey look even zp is the victim of it we've got one available here but it doesn't translate super well. Um, and I will talk about this one in blue um, in a minute as well. The other thing that happens as well is people kind of start coming to us and saying, oh, I want interdigitated electrodes, et cetera. Um, I think it's when everything else has been tried, people start trying interdigitated electrodes. And something that we found at ZP actually is electrogeometry really doesn't seem to affect the signal that much. When you've got macro electrodes, um, fuel cells, electrolyzers, places where distances and currents are very high. Electrogeometry really matters. But when you're down in the microamp, nanoamp region, electrogeometry starts becoming a lot less important or a lot less sensitive to it. Of course, if you put two electrodes massively apart, but in screen printed electrodes, the currents are often very small and the distances are very small. And so actually geometry, people are very obsessed. Oh, I need, you know, what, what's the optimum geometry? I'll show you some data in a minute. All geometries work. There's a true cost for customization. So this is an example. This is a um, screen printed electrode. Um, this is it zoomed in on. Um, this is a company that ZP ended up buying after they went into liquidation, but they wanted a low cost screen printed electrode. So they wanted it low cost. Because they were going for customization, they actually had low volume. So they wanted low cost, but they were actually low volume themselves. And the fact they wanted low cost and low volume, and they, but they were low volume meant they actually had low quality. <laughs> And they ended up paying for that low quality through what I call low yield. So when they had this material coming into them, so they are, you know, they sent the design out to several vendors. They all bid on it. One of them made it for them. When they came in, they actually found they had a yield of 33%. So only 33% of what they were receiving was actually any good. Um, and they, so not only did they pay for, you know, let's say 100% of it, only 33% it was no good. And actually it took them all that effort to find the, the, the one third that was actually good. So they did pay for this through the cost of effort uh, actually in the lab. And in the end, they made something that was too, um, how can I put this, too big and too complex. So what they literally made a screen printed electrode system that was just too big and size does actually impact cost. And it was too complex. So look at this, you know, there's all these, um, reference electrodes on here, there's a common counter, there's all this working electrode, there's plenty of places for this to go wrong. So too big and too complex and eventually actually went to liquidation. Um, so insolvency, liquidation, bankruptcy, whatever you want to call it, that was the impact. And I actually see that quite a bit, that customization too early on does lead to business failure and therefore impact um, failure. Big secret about electrogeometry. The big secret about electrogeometry, and I'll put a link, but I'm going to send a recording out to everyone who's attended today. So no need to sort of, um, but I'll send you a um, uh, this link as well. Um, what we are saying here is actually all these geometries were all used to measure conductivity. This is a rectangular geometry. This is the spiral geometry. This was a, a Toledo, a Metla Toledo conductivity probe where it had two platinum electrodes that were probably about one centimeter apart and had areas of electrodes of one centimeter squared. Very different from the two screen printed electrodes. Um, it all gave the very same results or very similar results. So what does this tell you? Electrogeometry and the idea that I have to customize to get the optimum electrogeometry. I actually think that that's it's not such a strong argument that you would otherwise um, think. And I think that people need to, um, in some ways, actually focus on um, on where they can add effort. So for me, where is the real added value actually? It's actually in that functional part. When you take that electrode and you add the um, 
the when you develop the assay, I'll just um, do something. When you develop the assay and you start testing in the sample, that's the value add. It's not the screen printed electrode. It's not the production of the screen printed electrodes. It's not the um, design of a unique geometry. It's actually the assay itself is really where an investor would see a, a smart investor. It's not the same as government funding, which is not necessarily smart investment, but a Silicon Valley smart investor would understand that actually it's the assay and the data that you have on real samples is the real value. The other part of your real value add is actually the method or the method file. Um, what I mean by the method file is how do you actually make that? Um, um, how do you make that assay um, work? Somebody was just asking us actually, you know, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to comment on other vendors, um, but I would say that the one thing that makes ZP very different from other vendors is um, the reproducibility of our electro, the fact that we can get relative standard deviations when testing them electrochemically of 6%, if not better. That's what makes us different. And I'm also going to do a demonstration at the end. Um, um, I'm also going to de demonstration at the end, actually, that might help you understand that ZP has a very different view on screen printed electrodes. ZP's view is this is part of a technology stack, and I'm going to get to that technology stack really quickly. I also just want to quickly, I just saw something pop up that said, um, if you're interested in the ZP products, the guy in India is called Technando. So your value add is the assay and the sample. That's what, that's what a smart investor would see. Then the method file, and then the calibration routine. Um, the calibration routine is obviously how to turn that raw signal actually into a meaningful concentration and maybe a demonstration. But these four things, I think, is where you should spend your time. What is the assay? What is the sample? What's the method? What's the calibration? That's the intellectual property. That's what you should be patenting, in my opinion, obviously. I think the electronics are actually secondary. Um, what I mean by that is when I was, was, it, I was in Silicon Valley for at least six years and somebody said to me there, uh, he was the chief scientific officer of a company that eventually got sold for a billion dollars. Uh, the reason I bring it up is because he said to me, the engineering can always be ha it can always be done. He said to me, it's actually the assay that's really valuable. So when I say the electronics and development of electronics is a secondary matter, A, it's my opinion, B, it's opinion of other people, and C, actually, there's so many good electronics now available. It's almost like you, know, you just assume that the electronics can happen. Um, so we've got, you know, little chip electronics like this. You know that there's other people out there. You're all perfectly aware of these small potential stats. And um, all the techniques that we can now do in the lab, when I say all the techniques, let me just go to this camp. You know, this device here can do all of the techniques that we would normally do in the lab. Um, and it can do all, you know, we're using this as a both as an R&D platform, but also as a platform for actually productizing other people's assays. And I will come back to that. Um, shortly as well. So um, electronics is definitely a secondary thing. Um, your real value add is actually in the electrochemistry um, itself. And at ZP, you know, we do talk about open source potential stats. I host this on the website, you know, but I think the real value in open source potential stats these days is, um, you know, and there's there's ones based on Arduino, simple stat, these all exist. It's my opinion, but I think I wish I had made some open source potential stats myself. But because really for my training and my edification, not because of the commercialization. Um, otherwise, it's a distraction of your energy and your resources to necessarily make um, another potential stat. Um, I think the thing we should actually be focusing on is actually user experience. Um, so people are very interested in the kind of, you know, analog front end, digital back end. But actually, let's talk about user experience. So if I just go to this, um, in fact, I will. Um, yeah, in fact, what I do, I'll just change this very quickly. So this is the potential stat at the, uh, that I've got running at the moment. I'm just going to open up my um, my smartphone. It's in Bluetooth connection. Um, it's in, in fact, it's not in Bluetooth connection, but I will make it in Bluetooth connection um, with the device. Um, and I will scan that, which also um, helps as well. But this, when I, when I talk about um, when I talk about usability, see, this has LEDs that kind of guide that user experience. It has a very easy way of clicking um, screen printed electrodes in and out of the device. Um, you know, has a sort of simple on and off. Uh, you know, so that people know when it's on and know when it's off because the LED lights up. It has this capability of, you know, 
users and users are inevitably the one thing I don't like about slots on the front of instruments is slots are terrible for the ingression of liquid. So the way this is designed, there's no chance of getting an ingression of um, or liquid getting into the instrument. Easy to click up, click up and click down to actually get um, electrical contact um, with the device. So people are not really thinking, and it's not very fair to kind of criticize people for it, but they're not thinking about the user experience. They're thinking about the, let's say the electronics, but I'm saying electronics are actually very done. It's more important to think, you know, how are you going to get, how are you going to have an impact? People have to use the instrument. So people are more sort of focused on some of this underlying science and engineering and not thinking about um, how that device is actually going to be in the hands of um, users. But at ZP, we do, it's quite easy to put these um, very small, single board potential stats now into various form factors and that's what we've been um, doing a lot of i'm going to go a bit quicker because i'm sort of mindful of, of people's time but this is the there's a big problem in life which is everyone is working between technology net technology readiness level um one and everyone wants to get to technology readiness level number nine um there's something called the valley of death this has been around let's say or this concept has been around for at least 20 years um and governments um uh, try to bridge this gap by sort of strategic funding and all sorts of programs because they want more technology to actually hit the market and let's say be impactful um but as i say this is a 20-year problem and actually the problem still exists now at zp we're taking a slightly different um view on this we actually want to close that gap between what the kind of technology that you're using in the lab um, which is basically holding you at technology readiness number three. We want to bring you, we, we want to bring people through to technology readiness level number nine. Um, and so if you look at so the, the when you look at technology readiness levels, you have basic principles coming up to um, system deployed. Um, but that can actually take five years and in reality it can actually take 10 to 15 years and in reality only 10% of people ever actually make this. This is a very broken system. Whereas with our Sense It All platform, what we're trying to say is let's do this in two years. So if you're doing an assay and it's a fairly simple assay and you've done the um, meth, you've done the develop the assay, maybe some nanomaterials, you've tested in real samples, you've got a method file and you've got a calibration, that's really quick for us to actually put onto our platform and turn it into um and turn it into um, a um, into an assay that you can actually then give to alpha and beta testers. So we're trying to cut out many of the things that would otherwise hold you back, which is probably the instrumentation and probably the distribution of the instrumentation and actually say we do have this instrumentation. Um, and in fact, it's very easy for people who are doing electrochemical biosensor development to actually come onto this. But it also means they have to be on the screen printed electrodes as well. Um, let me just um, so we have a technology stack. Uh, I've got the hardware in front of me now. I'll do a demonstration on in a minute. We have screen printed electrodes. Um, some of them could be, uh, we're selling packs of 300 of these for less than 300 euros. So they work at about 90 cents each. We have an app. This app is already available on the Android store and the Google store. And this app is not saying I've really, I haven't mentioned it at all so far, but actually it connects to the cloud. So when you do testing, all of the data is immediately going to the clouds um, in an account that you have. And all these things actually exist. And I'll do a demonstration of that in a minute. And so therefore, it says the hardware exists, the app exists, the cloud exists. Therefore, you need to add the value actually where the real value add is, which is actually in that electrochemical assay. So um, this is a QR code. If you've got an Android phone and you were to scan this QR code, you would find that it would take you to the um, Play Store and you would be able to install an app called um, Sense It All. Um, if you've got a um, iOS system or you know a, an Apple phone, you would find that this by scanning this code, it would actually take you to the um, uh, Apple Store. Um, you will find, and in fact, I can even do it um, now, um, that we have a range of, whoops, a daisy, a range of QR codes. Every When the app is actually installed, you are able to scan those QR codes off this smartphone. And so we're doing it because we do uh, uh, technology for measuring chili, technology for measuring ginger, technology for measuring pH, technology for measuring nitrate, total antioxidant capacity, um, glucose. So these are assays that we already have and um, potassium. We have all these things because we've got various clients um, 
and users around the world who need these um, apps um, from us. Um, but then we also have this app here. If you were to scan this app, what you'll find is that it would allow you to have your own brand, your own sensor, your own assay. Um, and so essentially it's sort of saying, this is not a ZP, this is a platform that ZP uses, but it's not exclusive to ZP. In fact, you can use it yourself. And then this is the bit that really closes the gap. It's actually, even though we're saying this is a technology that we use in the market, it's also got other QR codes for techniques like amperometry and open circuit potential, because actually it's an R&D instrument. So suddenly we're now in a situation where this instrument, um, which you know has a very nice user experience, very nice way of taking, you know, ZP screen printed electrodes, has all that good, all those good features, is also a tight scientific instrument. So suddenly you're going from doing an amperometric experiment in the lab to actually being able to do an amperometric and prometric assay that's adding real impact and that's the gap that we're really trying to close when i say we're trying to close that that valley of death this is um this is what it um this is what this is the gap how we're closing it and we're closing it by saying there shouldn't be a gap between the r d that you use in the lab and the product that you actually ship to a client or ship to alpha and beta testers so as I say, one of the QR codes allows all of the ZP kind of stuff to essentially be taken out and actually replaced with either the academics branding or the startups um, branding. So that's sort of the intention of, of the um, platform. So as I say, these QR codes, um, what's happening is the app is driving the meter and um, the meter is told what to do through the QR code. So it can, in one instance, it can be doing pH, in another instance, it can be doing nitrate total antioxidative capacity, glucose, potassium. It's the same app, the same hardware. It's just the sensor that's changing um, and the assay that's changing. But we can change the assay quite, sim assay quite simply just using the QR code as well. So you can see. And then, as I just say, um, you can do also do amperometry, open circuit potential as well. I know there are questions jumping up, um, but I want to kind of get to a quick demo. So I, I can see questions, but my apologies. Um, the app is making... Um, this app is on my Wi-Fi. Um, I can also use my data plan. The app is actually also connecting with a cloud system called Julie. So every time you make a measurement, you get the result. You get a result on your phone, but you actually get the raw signal in the cloud as well. Um, and so you get the result and the raw signal and it all goes to the um, cloud. So I'm going to do a quick um, a quick demonstration um, very quickly. I appreciate we've gone over by three minutes. So I'm going to try and be super fast and efficient um, with your time and respectful of your time. So I've got the app on my phone. Um, I scanned the QR code. Um, so I told it what assay to run. Um, they say slots are not good. Slots are not good for, you know, so you need. I like the fact that we can just clip the sensor in there. The nice thing about ZP is we're the biggest users of our own technology. So we realized that when we were trying to slot things in, first of all, it was hard to slot screen printed electrodes into slots. And B, then it gave an ingression for liquid. Um, so let me just run that very quickly. Um, and I also mentioned user experience earlier on as well. I'm just going to give this a quick name. Uh, let me just, yeah, I'll just. So this name will allow me to find this this name and this cluster will allow me to find this later on on the um, on the cloud system. I'm just going to tell you what dilution I used. And that's it. Now, what I really like about electrochemistry as well is actually you can um, you can make fast assays. I often find that people have slow assays because actually they're doing things like calibration steps first. But again, at ZP, we do try to work on um, making sure our assays are nice and fast. So you can probably see some flashing here. What's going on here is actually um, I'm getting a progress update through the QR code and I also get a progress update on the app as well. So the app and the machine are telling me the same thing. So I get a result on my phone. So let me just go to that. Whoops, Daisy, that's so bleached out. Um, but I do have a result on my phone. So that's simple for end users. End users need simplicity. How do you make your data impactful? So even though that machine um, was running actually voltammetry in that case, whoops, the daisy, um, it was running voltammetry. We didn't show voltammetry on the app because the end user in this case doesn't necessarily want that kind of um, uh, information, let's say. 
but I do want to just quickly show you something as well. Um, so I'm just signing into a, um, a cloud system that um, we have at ZP. Um, every time we run an assay, um, if, I, if I go done, the data just went up to the cloud um, and then I'm able to essentially navigate. Can you imagine the effort that it's gone in to, in fact, here it is now, so I get wrong screen. Let me just share my screen with you. So this is it here. I can actually see the date here, the date and time. I can see the data. So um, I ran an assay on my phone. The user gets the number, but more importantly, the raw signal also went to the cloud as well. And so that's really important for you because let's say you were developing something for a rural community in India. You could give them a result on their phone, but you could also then go and quality check, most importantly, the data in the cloud um, because the data is um, is essentially up in that cloud as well. So I am going to do a bit of a wrap up now. I did see some questions coming through. What I want to do is I'm going to send everyone a copy of this um, of this webinar. So I will check. So hopefully then you'll be able to bring your questions straight to me. So if I summarize, I have touched upon micro needles today. We do have micro needles available on the ZP web store. Um, I just want to give you that kind of health warning that you know, at least one company working on micro needles has raised over 150 million US dollars in the last two to three years. It's a hard project to work upon. Biggest problem with screen printed electrodes. Somebody did ask me why are our screen printed electrodes better than another vendor? I would never claim to. I, I think one of the problems going on in this world is that at ZP, we have focused on reproducibility and we have focused on not trying to make hundreds of different designs because actually our experience is that different designs don't actually make any difference. Um, narrow the designs, get everyone on the same electrode. That allows us to have high volume. Then we get high volume and low price. Um, electro customization, I think, I genuinely think that electro customization, especially too early, just leads to liquidation and bankruptcy. You've got people want low price, they've got customization, they end up with low quality, and then they end up trying to fix that low quality and they don't really um, get on with the job that they need. Electronics, if you've got money to spend in this world, do you develop electrochemical assays or develop brand new electronics? Develop the assays. That's where the real intellectual property lies. Commercialization. I think commercialization is accelerated when we start using, and I'm biased, so you know, I have to put that in there. When we use things like the Sensi All platform for doing both our lab work, we then know actually just through the change, you use the QR code, we can go from lab work to the deployable product so much easier. And that's how we get from TRL3 to TRL9 much more rapidly. So I just want to say thank you very much. I apologize for going over by eight minutes, um, but thank you for your attention. I did see the questions pop up. I'm not ignoring them, but whereas I have already gone eight minutes over. So I'm going to 